Back for Blood launched almost a year ago with strong comparisons to the fan favorite Left 4 Dead series, and ended up with a controversial start, garnering considerable negative reviews and press. I was never a big fan of Left 4 Dead myself, often finding it boring unless I was playing with a full group of friends, and I was a big fan of Turtle Rock's previous game, Evolve, but unfortunately the game was managed poorly and ended up dying off. Back for Blood is now well into its post-release cycle and has launched two DLCs, so I decided that I'd see if the game has improved, determine if the negative stigma surrounding it is actually warranted or not. Turtle Rock has made some system updates and launched two DLCs since the game's initial launch. The DLC system functions so that if any player in a lobby owns a DLC, the content is shared with everyone, allowing DLCs to not split the player base, which has already been significantly reduced. Furthermore, one of Back for Blood's most prominent complaints early on was its lack of an offline gameplay option, which has now been added. Obviously, this should have been in the game earlier on, but it is a welcome addition. I was able to play some of the DLC experiences in public lobbies, and while I don't think they are amazing, experiences felt like fun and intriguing additions, with one focusing on its own campaign story and a new enemy type, and another that can be found chosen to play in the already existing content. Back for Blood is certainly inspired and takes a lot of the formula from Left 4 Dead but the energy of the game feels slightly less campy, and a bit more serious. It follows the same act going through missions, setup, and constant horde of zombies as you do objectives to get through the mission until you reach the end and get into a safe house. Personally though, the game's cores feel very different to me, as Left 4 Dead focuses heavily on the base core gameplay promoting replayability, while Back 4 Blood's replayability largely seems found in its card system, supply line, and builds, which I'll discuss later on in the video. AI in horde games, especially the zombie genre, is vital to the game's enjoyment. The enemy AI in Back 4 Blood don't amaze me, but it was enjoyable enough. Enemies spawn all over the place, special ridden pop out pretty frequently, very similar to the specials from Left 4 Dead. Spawns are often enough that it feels like you have to be on your toes, but can also scavenge around for loot and items. Enemy AI unfortunately doesn't feel super random, which for a horde game means that repeated gameplay can get rather stale. Friendly AI isn't amazing, but it seems to have been improved, as at the game's launch, AI would literally randomly kill themselves and jump off places for seemingly no reason. The AI will follow you and help, but actual players will still have to do the interactable events to progress a mission, which can slow it down how fast it goes. Overall, my experience with the AI wasn't bad, but I wasn't exactly impressed either. Back for Blood's maps are pretty meh. Graphically, the game looks pretty good, and the areas are dark and grimy, but it often looks the same. And since a lot of the campiness of Left 4 Dead isn't there, areas don't have as much charm or aren't as memorable. Characters aren't as memorable either, if we're going on that. The only areas that I thought were particularly cool were hold-off missions such as camping in a bar while Black Betty plays. <laughs> If the game had more experiences like this, I feel like I would look forward to certain maps and areas a whole lot more, but realistically, the large percentage is forgettable. In all fairness, I never really liked Left 4 Dead that much, and I don't remember most of its areas or maps, except for the Clown Carnival map. So in all honesty, I don't think it's a super unique problem to Back 4 Blood, but rather most of the genre. Another vital component to a horde game's enjoyability is its gunplay and weapons. Gunplay feels smooth, but not very impactful. Overall, I like the game sounds and sound design, such as voice acting, but gunshots are generally a weaker point, with them feeling light or weak. However, I understand why this is done, largely because in a horde game, you are non-stop firing, and overbearing heavy gunshots all the time could get a bit draining. Gunplay itself feels pretty similar. Guns lack much recoil, they're easy to control, they don't feel like they hit hard or impactful, and don't feel super inspired. But similarly, I understand that the gunplay has to feel smooth and easy to control given the same genre. If you have to do CSGO gun control every time you shoot a zombie and repeat that throughout the entire time you're playing the game, it's just not gonna be fun. 
My favorite weapons were definitely the shotguns, which hit hard, felt the most impactful, but still had decent range. There was melee as well, but I found myself not liking that much, and instead using another gun as a secondary. Back for Blood uses a similar method of weapon customization as Left 4 Dead, with finding attachments around the map and putting them on your guns, as well as safe house customization shops that allow you to use copper, a currency you find throughout the maps, to buy offensive, defensive items, team upgrades, health, armor, and weapons. You're allowed to use copper to switch out attachments on different guns, meaning if you've got a great attachment on a bad gun, you can bring the attachment onto your next one. It's a good change, but realistically just a quality of life improvement from the Left 4 Dead system. The major component in revamp in Back 4 Blood over Left 4 Dead is the card system. As you progress through the game, you unlock more cards that provide buffs, alternate stats, build offense, defense, engineering, and more. You build decks with the cards you have while in the lobby and headquarters area, and then head out. As you play throughout an act and finish missions, you are able to choose from selected cards to boost your character and push towards a specific build. This allows players to focus on a certain type of playstyle, and can improve the replayability of the game vastly, especially if playing with friends. My understanding is that recently cards were nerfed, however, so that the potency of certain builds aren't as strong. Whether that stays or not is unknown, the game is still in a post-release cycle and at least one more DLC is still going to come out. Supply lines function as the way for cosmetics, some cards, and alike to be purchased through in-game currency that you receive at the end of missions called supply points. This is another good method to increase replayability as there is a constant goal to strive for that you can visually see and notice as it progresses. It's not great and the cosmetics aren't amazing, but once again, it's a welcome addition to the game itself. Ultimately, Back for Blood draws lots of comparisons and similarities to Left 4 Dead 2, but their core focuses and draws for replayability are wholly different. Back for Blood is fun and an enjoyable game. It's not perfect and not my favorite zombie shooter, but for fans of board games, I think they would actually like it. At the end of the day, Left 4 Dead 2 probably reigns supreme for most people and still has considerably more current players than Back for Blood on Steam. Thankfully, Back for Blood does have crossplay though, so that boosts the player base quite a bit, but not enough to play the PvP swarm modes, which I tried matchmaking for, but found nothing. At the end of the day, if you want a horde shooter that focuses on a quote-unquote rewarding replayability aspect, then Back for Blood might be up your alley, but I wouldn't recommend it unless it's on sale. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, leave a like and subscribe for future content. Let me know what you want me to cover next in the comments, and I'll catch you later. Thanks.